Good morning, everyone. So earlier in the week, I was having a chat with my six-year-old godson, Kian, and he asked me how the body works and how does our body parts know what to do. And I told him it's the brain that tells the body what to do. If you get a cut, for example, the nerves send a message to your brain that you're injured and the brain will tell you to call for help. If you are eating, the stomach will at some point send a signal to your brain to tell you that you're full and then you'll stop eating. And he said, so the brain is the leader, yes? And I said, something like that. And he actually paused to consider it. And then he followed up. He said, Godpa, is it the brain or is it the heart that is the leader? Which I thought was pretty profound. And I said, well, sometimes the heart leads and sometimes the head leads. But it should be the head. That is why I always tell you to think before you do things. Your heart is selfish. Your heart sometimes tells you to snatch a toy from your sister. But you think first, what should I do? What does Jesus want me to do? And then you act. And he said, oh, I know why the brain is leader. Because it's the highest. It's, the, it's right on the top, right? And that is why it's the leader, yes? And I said, well, that's one way to look at it. Now, Paul uses the word mind or think no less than 10 times in this brief letter. For Paul, our head, our mindset, how we think is absolutely essential to the way we live. Our way of thinking determines our way of living. And if you want, therefore, to develop the heart of a gospel partner, if you want to prioritize gospel partnership in your lives, as we heard about last week, if you want to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, then you must have the right kind of mind to facilitate that sort of life. The question before us today is this, what kind of mindset does a gospel partner have? What kind of mindset does a gospel partner have? And here's the short answer to the question, a mindset of humility. A mindset of humility. The kind of mind that produces gospel partners is a humble mind. Humility is the mental disposition inherent in gospel partners. Or to put it differently, Without a mindset of humility, there cannot be gospel community. If Hermonites are not humble, then Herman will not be a church of gospel partners. In fact, without humility, it remains to be seen it will even be a church at all. And I know humility is a character trait, but Paul would regard it first as a mental attitude. Our way of thinking, remember, determines our way of living. And since this sermon is about humility, aren't you guys lucky that you have just the right preacher for the job? Given that humility really is one of the many outstanding qualities that I possess. Sometimes I worry that I'm too humble, but then I remind myself, don't be silly, Lewin. You don't make mistakes like that. You're always just the right amount of humble. Now, I'm kidding, of course, but what it demonstrated was that the man who thinks he's humble is actually not being humble. That's what, make pride. That's what makes pride so sinister. With more sins, you can identify them within yourself. If you're stealing, you know you're stealing. If you're a glutton, you can see you're a glutton. It's hard to avoid seeing those sins in yourselves. But pride, pride is a different animal. Its power lies in deceit. It takes a proud person to believe he's humble, whereas the humble person is all too aware of his pride within his heart. So friends, are you proud? Do you need a lesson in humility? And the irony is that the people who are humble will be the ones who will say yes and listen to this message most intently. Whereas the ones who think they do not need a lesson in humility are in fact the ones who need it most urgently. Now let us pray as we head into the text. Let us pray. Father, we ask for your grace that we might put aside our pride and humbly come to you with open hearts and open minds to receive your word for us this morning. Teach us, Lord, we pray, to be humble before you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now, we're going to explore the mind of the Gospel partners today, and we will see three things in which humility is the defining characteristic of this mindset. First, have a mind which in humility considers others above yourself. Have a mind which in humility considers others above yourself. Verse 1, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Three sub-points, the imperatives of gospel partnership, the indicatives of gospel partnership, and the inheritance of joy in gospel partnership. First, the imperatives of gospel partnership. Here we ask the question, what does Paul want us to have and want us to do as gospel partners? Here's what he wants us to have. Being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Same mind, same love, full accord, one mind. Let me unpack these attributes a little bit. The same mind. Now, the word for mind here derives from the Greek word phroneo, which we first encountered in chapter 1, verse 7. It is right for me to phroneo this way about you. It is the same word in the Greek, except in chapter 1, verse 7, it was translated feel. It was right for me to feel this way about you, which goes to show how closely related our heads and our hearts actually are. For the way we think is so influential in shaping the way we feel. The same love. He wants us to have the same agape, which we saw in chapter 1, verse 9. How the nature of this agape Love is organic and dynamic and has the potential to abound more and more and to bear fruit. Paul wants us to be united in this agape love. Full accord is the English translation, but the Greek literally means a joint psyche. Psyche, from, the, from which we derive the word psychology, has to do with the mind. Which is why when the word first appears in chapter 1 verse 27, it is translated, mind. I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one psyche, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. It's translated full accord here. It was the same word translated mind in chapter 1 verse 27, which reveals again how greatly Paul is emphasizing the mind in this text. Full accord literally means like-minded co-minded or united in mind. One mind. Paul books ends these attributes with the mind. Same mind, one mind. He's repeating himself for the sake of clarity and emphasis because he wants us to know that the way to encourage gospel partnership is to develop the mind of a gospel partner. He wants us to have the same mind, the same love, a common mind, and one mind. That is what he wants us to have. Now, what does Paul want us to do? He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So, a few things he wants us to do. Negatively, he states this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Positively, count others more significant than yourselves. Look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. What makes the difference between these two? What's the conversion? In humility. That's the attitude. And in these verses, we can extract a brilliant definition for humility. Namely, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Again, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. Or to put it another way, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking more for 
others. It is counting others more significant than yourself so that you can consider their interests above your own interests. Which is precisely what verse 4 means. Let each of you look not only to his, to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, I just want to point out here that it is not a 50-50 situation. It's not like look half the time to your own interests and half the time to the interests of others. That is not what Paul means at all. He means to give far greater weight to the interests of others than we give to our own interests. And unless you get that, the letter to the Philippians won't make sense to you. Verse 3 itself wouldn't make sense to you. Count others more significant than yourselves. Paul is asking us to consider our interests minimally and consider the interests of others maximally. We consider the bad necessities of our interests and consider greatly, significantly, maximally the interests of others around us. And that is what makes humility. Humility is key and the mind is key. And when we bring them together, we will see that the way to be a gospel partner is to have a mindset of humility, where we do not think of think less of ourselves, but we think of ourselves less and we think of others more. That is how we fulfill the imperatives of gospel partnership. Next, the indicatives of gospel partnership. You see, Paul could very well have omitted the indicative verses of verse 1 and retained the imperatives of verse 2 to 4. He could well have said, therefore, Walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, as you have heard in chapter 1, verse 27. And this means that you don't uh, do anything out of selfish ambition and conceit, but in humility, uh, consider the interests of others above yourself. He could well have said that, but he doesn't. He begins with the indicatives. He begins with if. He's using if in the same way as when we say, if you love me, you will marry me. If you want to pass this class, you better complete these assignments. He's not talking about if as an in a probability. He's building his argument on sure and certain gospel realities of being in Christ. He's sure of this. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. Now, why preface the imperatives of gospel partnership with the indicatives of gospel partnership? Because the indicatives matter. It is because you have received encouragement in Christ. It is because you feel comfort from His love. It is when you experience the fellowship in the Spirit. It is when these gospel realities take place in your life and takes root in your heart. It is these things that will compel you to adopt a mindset of humility and encourage you towards gospel partnership. These indicatives matter because without them, you will only be motivated to accomplish the imperatives from a sense of duty. You will feel like you have to, but you will not feel like you want to. And that robs the gospel partner of his joy. But this latter is eminently about joy. The way to create joyful gospel partnership is by banking on gospel indicatives to fuel and motivate gospel imperatives. Now, on this note, we come to our third sub-point, the inheritance of joy. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being on the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Again, this is not about duty. It's about joy. Paul, the gospel partner, is filled with thankful joy whenever he remembers his gospel partners in prayer. He makes it clear to them that there is joy inherent in gospel partnership. There is joy to be had. And that joy is completed by unity. And if unity requires humility, then we can assume humility joyfully. It is this unity 
that calls for sacrifice and humility, but it will be a joyful sacrifice, a joyful humbling of ourselves. There is an inherent joy in gospel koinonia. Some of you would have heard of the parable of the long spoons, right? One day a man said to an angel who visited him, show me a glimpse of heaven and hell. So the angel showed the man two doors. Inside the first door behind it, in the middle of the room was a large round table with a large pot of the most incredible smelling, delicious looking stew. And the pot was full, but everyone sitting around the table were emaciated. They were thin and sickly. They were literally starving. Now, each one of them was holding a spoon with six foot long handles. Because the handle was longer than their arms, they could not get the spoon back into their mouths. They could not feed themselves. And they were famished. And the angel said, Now, you have seen hell. Let's go to the second door. And behind the second door, the room appeared exactly the same. There was that large round table with the large pot of wonderful steel right in the middle. And the people had the same six foot long spoons, but they were well nourished and they were healthy and they were talking and they were laughing. They were joyful. And the man said, I don't get it. What's the difference here? And the angel replied, this man of heaven arrived at the table considering how to serve one another. So everyone was able to eat. Whereas in hell, everyone was determined to only serve himself. Now imagine a church where everyone is more concerned for the other than themselves. Where everyone comes to church and instead of asking what's in it for me, they ask, how can I be of service to you? Now what kind of church would that be? It will be a church where no one is starving, where everyone is well fed because everyone is looking to the welfare of others. You would enjoy, I assure you, being in that sort of church. You would rejoice to be in that church. There is joy, you see, inherent in gospel partnership. So have a mind, friends, which in humility considers others more significant than yourselves. And it will not only build unity, it will bring us joy. For the sake of joy then, have a mind which in humility considers others more significant than yourselves. Second point, have a mind which prefers humility as a servant over equality with God. Have a mind which prefers humility as a servant over equality with God. Again, three sub-points under this heading. The echo of Adam, the example of Christ, and the entailment of the cross. And here now we come to the great hymn of Christ, known traditionally as the kenosis hymn. Kenosis meaning emptying. The emptying hymn of Christ. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Let me expand verse 5 for clarity. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He really means, have this mind in you, which is yours, because you are in Christ, and this mind is in Christ. Have this mind in you, which is yours, because you're in Christ, and this mind is in Christ. Do you see the affection, the heart that we need to be a gospel partner, Christ supplies. How I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. The affection that we need to be a gospel partner, Christ supplies. Similarly, the mind, the head that we need to be a gospel partner, Christ supplies likewise supplies. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind because it is yours. It is yours in Christ. And so, what is the mindset of Christ like? It is characterized, as the name of the hymn suggests, by a humble emptying of oneself, 
We'll get into that, but first I want us to see how the hymn is crafted to bring up a contrast between Adam and Christ, between the fallen nature in us and our new nature in Christ. Let's see the contrast in this chart. The Christ is made in the form of God, Adam in the image of God. Christ did not grasp hold of what belongs to him, Adam grasped hold of what did not belong to him. Christ sought solidarity with man, whereas Adam sought equality with God. He wanted to be like God. Christ was obedient to the point of death, whereas Adam's disobedience led to death. Christ was exalted by God as a result. Adam banished by God for his sin. The main point of the Adam-Christ contrast in the hymn is this. Adam, in pride, sought to become like God. Christ, in humility, became a human being. Adam, being created in human form, grasped at equality with God, whereas Christ, though he was in the form of God, stooped to accept equality with the human race. The significant implication is that in his humility, through his incarnation, Christ has reversed the conduct and consequence of Adam. Whereas Eden sank to grief at Adam's fall, now creation rises to rejoice at Jesus' exaltation. And this came to pass, the hymn teaches, because of the mind of Christ. Because of the way God thought, because he was willing to humbly empty himself. Have this mind amongst yourself, which is yours in Christ. Let us dwell now to the mind of Christ. The example of Christ. Now, Christians must recognize that while Jesus is a lot more than a mere moral example, he is never less than that. Imitate me, Paul says, as I imitate Christ. So friends, whom are you imitating in your life today? Who is your example for a good life? You see, it's common as human beings to come across someone who we either idolize or envy. And you say, I want to be where he is. Or I want to have what she has. And we ask, how did he get there? And how did she get these things? And subconsciously or otherwise, we follow in their footsteps. We think their thoughts after them in the hopes of becoming just like them. Now the problem is that in this fallen world, in this rat race, the winners are often the biggest, fastest, strongest, most aggressive rats. But they are, at the end, still rats. Now watch the reality TV show Survivor. You observe how politicians maintain power. You see how people climb up the corporate ladder. They don't get there by being meek, you realize. They don't rise up in this world by being humble and preferring the interests of others above themselves. No, you rise up by looking out for number one. You rise up by keeping taps, taps on your rivals. You rise by climbing over the corpses of your fallen enemies. And the bigger the pile, the higher you go. Only in the gospel, only in the story of Jesus Christ do we see an alternate reality, which is ultimate reality. Only in the gospel do we see that the path to victory, that the path to glory is paved with humility. Which means this, to have the mind of Christ is not simply an additional way of thinking, it is a complete replacement of our way of thinking. To have the mind of Christ, we must first reject the mind of Adam. Be careful, friends, who you imitate. Choose to imitate Christ. Choose to have His mind in place of the old mind that exists within you. The mind of Christ is the mind which prefers humility as a servant over the glories of equality with God. Because he believes that humility leads to ultimate glory. Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, 
being born in the likeness of man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Christ did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself. What this means is that Christ let go of his rights. He divested himself of his entitlements. He gave up his divine privileges as the Son of God. Let me ask, as very God of very God, was Christ not entitled to enjoy the eternal glories of heaven? Did he not have the right to remain in heaven to receive the unceasing praise of angels? Is the Son not entitled to an unbroken relationship with the Father? Of course, Christ is absolutely entitled to these things, to these privileges. He had legitimate right to them. But he could not hold on to them and be our incarnate atonement for sin at the same time. And he chose to be our saviour instead, suffering loss and grief, experiencing humiliation and anguish, enduring the wrath of the Father in our place. Christ, you see, gave up his rights to make us right. He emptied himself to make us complete in him. Christ let go of his glory to take hold of us sinners. He humbled himself to the extent of death so that he might bring us life. That is agape, a love which sacrifices oneself for the sake of others. It is a selfless love. It is a humble love. The mind of Christ is characterized not by selfish, close-fisted grabbing, but by selfless, open-handed giving. For God so loved, He gave. So friends, are you not within your rights to imitate Christ as a disciple of Christ? This means if it's true, that you're not within your rights to always insist on your rights. There is a point where fighting for your rights becomes wrong. There is a point where insisting on your rights is unbecoming of a Christian because that is not like Christ. So many of us feel aggrieved and offended sometimes and we feel justified in our anger and our resentment for the reason that our rights in that particular situation were not upheld, that our rights were not respected, that our rights were violated. And in such situations, I am angry and I am justified in my anger. This way of thinking is universally understood and accepted and regarded almost as sacred in our world today. But what if Jesus thought that way? How could you possibly nail God to a cross without violating His divine rights? How can atonement be made for our sins if Jesus had a mindset of my life, my rights? No one can take them away from me. How can humanity be made right if Jesus did not think it right to give up and surrender His rights? So I know you have rights. I'm not saying you don't. But I'm saying that if we all insisted on our rights, what will be left of humility? I'm not saying that rights are a bad thing either. Rights are good things. They are good things. But they are not the best thing. Christ is the best thing. And I'm convinced that unless we are willing to sacrifice ourselves and surrender even our rights for the sake of loving others, then we cannot be the gospel partners that Christ is calling us to be. It calls for humility and it requires a humble mind. And thanks be to God, we have this mind in Christ. And since we are on the subject of rights, let's talk about our rights in light of the cross, the entailment of the cross. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The cross in Roman times wasn't a fashion accessory. It was a torture instrument. 
Roman law reserved the cross for the worst and most violent criminals, and only those who were slaves or foreigners, which meant that a Roman citizen cannot, whatever he may have done, he cannot be executed by crucifixion. It was just that bad. Cicero, the historian, called death on the cross a most cruel and disgusting punishment. And the cross, friends, is nothing less than what we deserve for our crimes against the King of Kings. Make no mistake, the cross is ours. The cross is the instrument of the death that we rightly deserve. The cross is the punishment for our sin. There is no cross but our cross. Friends, remember this. The cross of Christ was first our cross. He bore it on our behalf. He hung there upon it in our place. In our stead, he stood condemned. So the cross is a reminder that we deserve nothing apart from hell. We are entitled to nothing except a one-way ticket to damnation under the righteous wrath of God. In other words, the cross stands in opposition to our pride. It stands as a demolisher of our rights. No one can trumpet their rights at the foot of Calvary. At the cross, our only standing place is grace. If we want to have this mind of Christ, if we want to learn humility, if we are willing to surrender our rights, we would do well to dwell on the cross. And remember, that is our cross. Finally, have a mind which remembers that humility is the path to glory. Have a mind which remembers that humility is the path to glory. Again, three sub-points here. The exaltation of Christ, the submission of humanity, and the glorification of God. The exaltation of Christ. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What we see in operation here is the immutable law of God's kingdom that self-humbling leads to exaltation. In the divine order of things, pride inevitably comes before a fall, but humility will inexorably lead to glory. The crucified Christ is now the exalted Lord. The humble one is given the name above all names, where every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, this is the renal name of the Lord of the Roman Empire at the time. Nero, Claudius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus. This is the name of the reigning Lord at the time. Nero is his birth name. Claudius is the name of his previous emperor. Caesar means Lord. Augustus means majestic. And Germanicus signifies the glory of Caesar over the realm of Germania. You see, in the ideology of the Roman world, Zeus, Jupiter, and the gods granted divine authority and granted divine names to the Roman emperor. In the theology of Christianity, God granted the divine name to Jesus so that everyone, everywhere, not merely in Rome, not merely in Germania, but in heaven and on earth and under the earth, will all proclaim with one voice that Jesus is Lord. So by quoting this hymn, Paul presents the exaltation of Jesus as Lord in a language that reflects and subverts the Roman imperial cult. It is a reminder that the Roman cross did not ultimately humble Jesus. Jesus, through the cross, ultimately humbled Rome. Remember, humility is the path to ultimate glory. Next, the subjection of humanity. Second, you observe here the posture of humanity before the Lord Jesus Christ. Every knee will bow. Bowing the knee is subjection before the one in authority. 
slaves bowed before their lords to show their subjection and willingness to obey. That is the rightful posture of humanity before the hyper-exalted Lord Jesus Christ. When the church worships Jesus by bowing down before him and proclaiming with one voice that he is Lord of all, the church offers a preview of the future submission of all creation to the Lord Jesus. And another thing happens. Ever felt proud while you're on your knees? Ever felt full of yourself when you're confessing that Jesus Christ and not you is Lord? You see, the remedy to pride is a posture of humility. It is to bear in mind that the humble Christ is now the exalted Lord, before whom we all must and will bow the knee. There is no room for pride in this posture, in his presence. Truly, as a Christian, there is no room for pride at all, for we exist and have our being and do our living in Christ. Finally, the glorification of God. Verses 9 and 10 of the hymn makes perfect sense. What they celebrate is consistent with the glory of God. Christ exalted, God glorified. But notice how verses 6 to 8 first appear to go in another direction. The initial three verses contradict any visible expectations for the celebration of God's glory at the end. The opening three verses do not lift up our eyes to the glories of heaven. They do not even lift up our hearts by showing us the miracles of Christ. No, they take us down. Down to the deepest, darkest depths of human history to see the horrific torture, the unspeakable abuse, the utter humiliation, and the cruel execution of a slave, a naked slave on a cross. We would think that inconsistent with the glory of God, but not so. All that Jesus did in his self-emptying, self-humbling, and Father-obeying death on the cross led to the glory of God the Father because the humility of Jesus expressed the very nature of God. And the revelation of the nature of God is the glory of God. So God was not glorified in spite of Jesus' humiliation. No, God was glorified because Jesus humbled himself to the point of death as a servant of man. Because that is the God, the nature of our God. And that is the glory of our God. The God whom we worship is the God of agape, sacrificial, humble love. The King to whom we bow the knee is the servant King. The life of Christ is characterized not by selfish, close-fisted grabbing, but by selfless, open-handed giving. And so the hymn comes full circle. The one who is equal with God now assumes his rightful place as God. The kenosis hymn, the emptying hymn, is a Christ-centered, God-glorifying and pride-nullifying hymn, which we would do well to remember and have in our mind if we desire to have the mind of Christ. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, a mind which in humility considers others above yourself, a mind which prefers humility as a servant over equality with God, a mind which remembers that humility is the path to true glory. And that, my friends, is how you become a gospel partner. Let us pray. Father Lord, we thank you for Christ. We thank you that you so loved the world that you gave. And Christ so loved us that he gave up his rights, even his life. Help us in your grace, through your spirit, have his mind in us. 
that we might follow in his footsteps and humbly love and humbly serve for our exaltation by you at the end of the day and for your glory in the fullness of time now and always in jesus name we pray amen